will be by Kenneth uh, Odo. He's from uh, Nigeria originally, but flew in from Vancouver today, all the way, long, long flight. Um, Kenneth is a software engineer, computer scientist, and data scientist working at an IoT startup. He's a regular speaker at a number of Vancouver AI meetups, uh, organizer of distributed systems meetup, member of the Haskell study group, organizer of applied cryptography study group. Um, during his time in graduate school, he worked as a research assistant in the field of visual analytics, where he built a number of novel web interfaces to support exploratory search and published a few journal papers. Let's have a warm applause for Kenneth and Kenneth is at the stage. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, the title of my talk is uh, Tracking the Tracker, um, Time Series Analysis in Python on First Principles. So I just chose that name because it sounds interesting. So it has nothing to do with the contents of the talk. So, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I will just describe some <coughs> information about myself and the, the goals for this project. Actually, uh, this is not any, this is not related anywhere to what I do at work. So this is part of a uh, side project I did, and a couple of work I did while trying to start uh, a company with a couple of friends. Although the company failed after one year of uh, attempt as a co-founder, it, it was a failure. But that's fine. So I can speak about failures too, not only success. So yeah, and then this uh, I'll be focusing on two things in the time series analysis. Uh, forecasting and an anomaly detection. So, um, um, yeah, so forecasting is just, okay, let me get to, uh, so this is pretty much uh, what I've done so far. And um, actually today there's no live coding, so um, because everything we need, uh, I already have two libraries written for this. So and they are available on my data page. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, can you hear me? I think this is clear. Yeah, that's better. So, uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me clearly, actually? Okay. So, uh, um, so there are two aspects. This talk will focus on forecasting and anomaly detection. So, uh, for forecasting, uh, it's it's all about answering this problem: How can we uh, predict the future? Using information from the past, so and uh, usually most times the, the future looks like the past <laughs> in, in most regards. So if you can learn some important things from the past, you can predict the future. So and then uh, the next one is anomaly detection. So that means um, you're given a point, for instance, a data point. Is it normal or normal? So so on answering this question, you have to define what is normal and what's not abnormal. So if your if your current data point uh, varies on what is normal, statistically normal, for you, in, your, in your context. The data points may be an anomaly. So, so it's a bit false here. So, uh, it's so because it's um, subject to interpretation. So, what's anomaly in the context uh, may not be an anomaly in another context. So, and I would uh, describe to you the kind of anomalies that I <coughs> focused on in this project, so this research work I did as part of uh, the company we tried to form. So. Yeah, so everything should be made simple. So now I'll give you the goals for this, for the motivations. So uh, we just, time series have many forms. So time series is just a matter of, uh, when, you, when you have data, point, data that happens at different time intervals, and you have each data for each point. So they can take different forms. So I'm just starting with it, just to motivate. This is just like a pole vote, someone jumping through the pole vote, and at time he has a position where he stays. So that's a time series, for example. So, for instance, if, if you have like a missile defense system where you have a, 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 an airplane to, to shoot out of the sky, so the plane is moving, the missile is moving towards it. So it's a time series if you measure how, uh, but this is like a physics-based time series time stop. So it's also time series. So, and then the most common ones um, uh, you know about is like maybe trending, fluctuating price of stocks or, or for instance, size of Bitcoin. Or whatever, this is time series. So I don't want you to narrow down your scope when you deal with that time series. So because most problems you have may actually be time series problems. So just how you formulate your problems. So and yeah, this is just one of the examples. So I'll see get back to this slide when I when I discuss about camera filters and how I motivated for this and, and why it was used in this project too. So 
Yeah, so the goals of this project is actually uh, to build a, a number of a, a number of time series uh, analysis and models that can work in real time, that are incremental in nature. So, so you start discussing about online algorithms and stream analytics. So it's this kind of domain of stream, stream analytics. So something that works in real time. You don't want to waste any time in computation. So, so. You got, um, when you use less computational like complexity, when, when the time for each operation uh, is as minimal as possible, uh, then it's easier at least to have better performance and then you can also have some, some benefits when you scale. So and then uh, the goal of this talk, uh, of this entire project I did then was to support both multivariate and univariate time streams. So and yeah, so um, to do this I wrote two projects. So you can see the URL, uh, this is and the first one is pie smooth. I don't know why I named it pie smooth, so maybe it sounds smooth in my ear. So this is um, a collection of algorithms. Was actually, I was, um, I was working for these hedge funds, uh, and, and we were trying to form a fintech company, as they call it, so to predict financial, and I was for financial risk for a number of portfolios. So I, the number of time series, time series seems like an easy problem, but there are a lot of um, open, Three areas that in, in time series that is, it's, despite its simplicity, it's still very difficult to be a fully solved problem. It's not yet solved. So and and then I decided okay, we started um, this. I started working on this project and uh, I feel, and read through a few research papers on the subject and I wrote some libraries about um, the Arima model. We usually know that's very common and then. Because the Arima model seems to be a static version. So I added what they call recursive list squares to make it incremental version. So it works in real time. So you don't have to get all a batch of data, so much batch of data. Or you don't even, you don't even need to keep sliding windows. So you just want to use like a term with damped window. So I will discuss different kind of windowing techniques and the, the, the design decision why that was chosen in, in this context. So like um, things like damped windows is like you just are the forgetting parameter and forget some part of the past and retain the future. So based on how, how you want your model to react to new data. If you want your model to be very reactive to, the, to, to very frequent data, you may want to uh, forget less of the past and retain more of the present. So, so you can actually these are variables you can all tune. And you can see there are many knobs you can tune when, when working with time series. So and then I just, and this other project we had like um, a, a Bitcoin application. So you want to predict the price of uh, maybe Bitcoin, uh, but um, if you want to use just, uh, there's not a lot of variables that you can actually uh, predict using the Bitcoin. So what I did was I figured out we could actually peg it on some existing uh, indexes like SP, S and P 500, and um, some other indexes to so use some other kind of Bitcoin and have those as a list of measurements. So the target measurement I was aiming for was like the Bitcoin analysis itself, the Bitcoin time trend. So and that's where I realized a good formulation for handling that kind of contest is the Kalman filters. Because it's, a, it's like a state space method where you have a series of measurements that may have some information about the state you're trying to predict. Since you have these measurements there <coughs> observable most, most of the time, and you, you can actually get to predict the next state which is not observable. You could use your measurements to augment your states and then update your process in an incremental manner. So that was part of um, why you see me discussing a lot about common filters too. So and I wrote part of those libraries, reading some research papers, and I also presented the my references so you can actually look to inspect the code. Then anomaly detection. Uh, this was part of the project we are, I was doing to uh, that company. So we are trying to like uh, uh, predict when uh, items become very popular on Twitter. So when you go into a stream. So we wanted a method where you, that, that is um, largely unsupervised. So you don't want to have um, um, too many lot of knobs and trying to fit um, like too many. You, you don't want to add so many knowledge to the system manually. You want the system to figure it out itself. So, and then uh, the number of methods like uh, in literature from the moving Exponential moving averages uh, to the moving, moving z scores and other kind of stuff. So I settled for using um, 
a probabilistic exponential moving average. So it's all about having a connecting parameter, then adding semester parameters for how likely that product, that uh, particular point is with respect to your distribution. So, and then I wrote a library about it and, and added a few supports for even multiple time series at the time. So with the kind of register to track multiple time series and, and estimate anomaly on them at the same time. So now I'll focus on forecasting now. So the first part of the slide is based on forecasting and the second part of the slide is based on anomaly detection. So uh, for, for forecasting, so uh, I think this will be complete if we don't discuss about the math. So in time series, uh, uh, time series is a lot of it's similar to techniques in regression, the number of regression techniques uh, commonly used. And uh, this presentation won't be complete if we don't discuss about stationarity. So, and I devoted a few slides for, for discussing that. And I also went to describe the number of um, theory behind why most of the model will fail in practice. So, and uh, presented it as part of the slides too. So these slides will be available by the end of the conference. So, yeah, so uh, mathematically, so for us to, to get some foundational concept on this subject, and um, so you can actually even do more research on, on your own too, it's good to understand some very basic math. So this is all, all around very basic um, arithmetic. So it's just, okay, time series is just a number of, um, like a list with time stamps, as like, like, like an index, something like that of that sort. So and then time series decomposition is just um, a way you can decompose a, a current time series to have a number of uh, com internal components in them. So it's, um, for instance, at every data point, um, a number of researchers have figured out that it's a combination of a trend, a cyclic component, and a polygon component, or, and then a residual is like the difference between your predicted value and the actual value. So, and, so those can actually occur either as an additive kind of sum or in a multiplicative form. So, and usually when you make a, a kind of a log of this kind of stuff, you split it out in the log converts your multiplication to addition. So yeah, this is just the basis for most of, of the time series analysis we have discussed. So and I would, when I go to the common combination, I would show you where how it maps directly to this decomposition too. So most algorithms you use are doing it internally. So it's good once you have the context of what this is, is internally, it's easier to move ahead. So then there's um, the autoregressive average. This is all about Okay, you have a time series, you want to you, you wanna fit a regression using some of the past. For instance, you have like a P indexes, like maybe a number of indexes back in time. So you want to fit a regression using those past, past data. So like, for instance, the, the price of today, maybe the stock price of today may have some relation to the price of yesterday, to the price of the day before yesterday, or maybe four or five, four days from now. So this is just a, this is just a straight regression, you're fitting it based on that. Then the moving average could be so. If sometimes you could also use the errors too that you get from each timestamp to actually fit. So this is the moving average um, the regression of on the errors at each timestamp back in time. So that's the moving average process. So why these two are, are important? Because what they call the AMA process. So this is the combination of both of them. So it's like your modeling it using the past data and also the past errors or past residuals. So sometimes you might, you might actually get a lot of information from having an understanding of the distribution of the errors, as well as the distribution of the data itself. So that you, you have two variables now to get things. <coughs> so now the most common part is this ARIMA model, which is like the, the auto-regressive integrated moving average. So this is an extension of the AMA process. So you, you, you add the time difference. This is like a kind of a, uh, the, the, the difference helps you to achieve uh, stationarity. So as, as they described that I will discuss later in the slide. So this is just a, a number of difference or uh, shifts in your data. So now, usually when people want to apply this like uh, ARIMA process in practice, they, they may use a concept known as Box Jenkins methodology to choose the best parameters. So because for instance, that's the P, Q, and D. So the P is, I told you, is like um, the, uh, Autoregressive uh, number of terms you are considering, like the number of um, historic data you are considering into the past. Then the Q is the number of error, error regression you are considering back in time. And the difference is just 
It's just related by this relationship. So then the other part of this that I won't discuss, so I presented a number of slides. So these are all like extensions of, uh, when you consider, instead of considering only, only errors, you consider like the variance and um, uh, having a kind of um, a mixed effect model, like a hierarchical model. So you're taking the residual from, from, from uh, it, uh, and using it to fit the next part of the reaction. So, and then some of them have a few relation to the exponential weighted average that I will discuss about in the normal, in the normal detection slides. So now, so the common filters uh, is a it's a it's it's a it's a state space method, and the only benefit you have from it is if you have, if you are trying to predict something that has that's not the next state is not observable from your current state, but you know you have some extra measurement that you could use. Uh, that is currently observable at the current moment. So, and then you so in that case you can actually use that state as your target variables they are trying to predict, and use the measurements to augment the state prediction. So, and then you you, you go on a two-step process. You, you predict and update. You, so it's like so if you make a mistake in your prediction, you update your model and predict the next step. So most likely in the future, as you keep predicting, you you get better as time goes on. So now they, they, there's a number of caveats. So how do you identify what are good measurement signals? So that's an open research problem. Right? So you have to figure it out. Like in, in the case of the Bitcoin, I was able to figure out that it, it has some relationship to the like S and P 500 uh, indexes and some other Bitcoin indexes that you could use. So, but in, a, in another context, it may be different. So, for instance, if you if you look up like someone maybe someone doing the ballistic means that now maybe taking like um, uh, okay, so measurement is tracking to involve the Doppler effect of the of the missile, the sound, how the distance, and all that kind of value. Then maybe the target variable will be the position at which the missile is. So those are the measurements for updating that state prediction, the next state. So, so those, this is just the loop you go through. So you 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 state updates predict, and then your measurements updates correct. So the, you you predict in the states. And then you take measurements and other stuff. <coughs> so this is just all about it. the the X here is actually your your states. So your state is limited uh, with, um, with, a, with like a linear function with the with the recently passed state and the kind of the parameter you use to fit in it. So and then you, you you may also have some extra parameters like some information you have. So the good thing about this is like you could even incorporate physics like those of people doing like localization like. Those trying to uh, use maybe uh, the, the signal, the Wi-Fi signals to improve your, your Google Maps. So the closest Wi-Fi signals or even your, your, your phone signals to help to position you on, on Google Maps. Those are the kind of problems. So they, they can add physics constraints like uh, Euclidean distance and those kind of distance from physics. So you can actually come up with some analysis to add those kind of information in your data. So, and then it's actually the continuous form of the forward algorithm of the hidden network model. So I actually put all the references so for those who are interested in that. So there are a number of common filters out there. So there's a, the district common filter. So this captures the linear relationship in the data. So what this is all about is you just have, you want to predict the states, and then uh, if you look at this part, like you calculate the common gain. Common gain is actually uh, how much is that's the, the forgetting factor? So how much of the past do you keep, and how much of the present do you retain? So it's um, it's so if you want like a, like a model that reacts very quickly to recent changes, you may give uh, less weight to the past so that it it varies quickly for the recent changes. And you see that it updates the measurement error. This is all about uh, you see there's a relationship. The z is like your measurement vector, and the x is actually your state vector. So, and the H vector is the vector that maps the state vector to the measurement vector. So, are you trying to check, to check the errors uh, at that point? So, it's like you're trying to fit um, the common gain. The common gain is like you're trying to, is, this is all around like an exponential moving average. It kind of goes, you forget in the past, and then you have a covariance matrix that you update with time. So, and, so, and the, 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 the irony of this is like your, your, your model for just around the mean and the covariance matrix. And then uh, you can't actually estimate if you have a nonlinear relationship, then this should this should break completely. So this will work properly. 
So I had implemented this in the in this in the slide in my in the Christmas library package. So then there's a there's a better part, the extended version. So in this case, um, you the function you have now is has to be a differentiable function. So then you start considering your Jacobians and uh, and uh, do, those yeah Hessians. So the, the, this is just actually you wanna you wanna <coughs> interpret nonlinearity by a linear stuff using Taylor series. So you just wanna uh, make a nonlinear expression in linear. But this is just correct to win the first order. So so um, it taps also nonlinearity in the data, but you also have to uh, know how close your non-linear function to work. So, yeah. So then, you the, the last phase. This is a this is a better version that most people use. So this actually is like rather than taking a, a point in your sampling space, you you put some extra point around that sample space, and I'll show you a description of this. So you, you so those extra points you take are called sigma points. So what, what that does is it helps you to capture more properties of, of the process you're trying to model. So they call it like it's like more erotic, as they say. So and it's, it actually captures this to like the third order and it's it's um, it also works for non-stationary data. So so that this is just trying to describe some of the geometric property of a covariance matrix. So how you align, align your coordinates. So now I can actually describe to you this. I want to contrast the, the extended common filter with the uncentered transformations. So if, if you have a, like just a normal sampling with a Markov chain, MCMC kind of a sampling, you're sampling repeatedly and checking, uh, passing through a function. You can see from this first chart that okay, the, this is what we are anticipating as our true kind of posterior after going through our priors. So what the standard common filter when it fits it, there's like a kind of a students, we are not fitting it properly. But when we take some more sample points around the current points we have taken, that's the UT, the uncertain transforms over there, uh, we can actually get a representation that is actually closer to the true distribution, which with, without sampling as much data points, we, we sample in the Markov chain sampling. So, and you see, we just, with only five points, we're able to get that close to fitting the distribution. So then the particle filtering, the particle filtering is matter of change and filter. We don't distort that into this light. So now I want to go to the recursive formulation because this is how I actually converted um, the the Arima model you have to be an incremental version. So what you just have here is like the normal like, regression. You have the parameters and you multiply it by your time, like your your what's it called your current time data point. So now at the next data point in time, that's T one. So you just want to use only the current point to update your model and get a new parameter theta. So without using the entire data point you have. So the, now you, you calculate the current error based on the past data you calculated, and then use what the sorry, the Sherman Morrison formula. So the benefit of this is, if you have a closed form of regression, a closed form for your regression, you, calculating inverses are very expensive when you do linear algebra. So you want to avoid calculating that inverse and they make your process scalable. And then you, you want to take a step further. Like um, if if you if you make a little perturbation to, the, to your matrix, like you, you add a little nudge to it, just like a new data came in and changed your data values a little, a little bit. So you, you, you want to just capture that in your covariance matrix. So that's what that does. And that's why I keep I kept it there. So probably you could read it up if you want to get some more ideas about it. And then the last line is related to that too. So, so yeah. So the, this is just how I converted to be an online version. So uh, yeah, taking this, the, usually most of these time series um, make assumption on stationarity, and so usually the number of transformations you have to perform in this are to be stationary. Like in the case of the Arima, when you change the value of d, the, the difference in value, you to make the data stationary. I'm discussing stationarity without discussing what stationarity is in, in the real form. So that will be the next slide. So yeah, you can actually check different values and then see which gives you a better performance based on some metrics there. So I put all the slides up there. So what's stationarity? So stationarity is um, when you have a kind of um, <laughs> uh, 
what is it called? Shift invariant joint distribution uh, that's constant over your data. So if you take a shift, like you have a data, then we take the mean from one batch of the data and another batch of the data, it should be constant. So that means it's stationary. So most of these time series analysis are based on stationarity in the data, which is not always attainable in nature. So the goal is that because the benefit of having this is if you know that the, the future will always be like the past, the worst you can do is just to predict the future by not saying the mean. So because that's why I described to you that you see sometimes your value your value having long term convergence towards the mean. So most times you could not predict the mean. And then they know they would be so far off. So that's what most of these time series methods are actually based on. So it's mean inverting and he has this Markovan assumption. So the Markovan assumption is like um, the future is independent of the past, given the present. So that means we can actually make predictions by just considering the, the current present to predict the future. Because we already know that the, all the current uh, past are already contained in the present. So we don't need to consider the past at all. So that's, I just try to describe it in this chart. And then, the, okay, then we move. The wise thoughts are hard to predict. So if, if you get uh, the soil coefficient market hypothesis, so if your data is identical and in, in, independently distributed, that means uh, the, 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 if, you, if you have a conditional probability on the past, so there's that all data are independent and random. So there's no pattern you can learn from, from the past. So and this can happen too in your data. So in that case, like the, the implication is that stocks are always at the right price, for instance. You cannot profit by buying or selling on the value of a money stock. So profit can be by cheating, sitting out with share investments. So if, what this means is that you cannot beat the market. So this has a kind of, um, uh, if, if this ever occurs, that means you cannot even learn from the past anymore. And that's why most companies that do this financial stock trading stuff, they find it very hard to beat the market, to beat the SP, S&P 500. And it's, uh, it's kind of, they try a lot of models and still have that issue. So now, what people do is that they, they take some domain knowledge that they figure out in the time series to pair it with maybe the price of the true is related with the price of gold, or they, they always relate to those two. So, and then, they use causal inference too. Okay, is this the implication of, is this happening, implies this will happen. So, and why do you need it? You should also have to try to avoid spurious correlation. So other things like outliers, collinearity, that's when you have two variables that are like highly correlated in there. Or when your, or when your variance is exploding, like, <laughs> or whether fitting or fitting. So those are all issues you consider. The same issues you have in regression. So they are all there too. So this is just a kind of how some of the API looks. So the recursive formulation is just the denied arima, the RLS protein. Vanilla I might describe. So I just so there are other approaches you could use. The popular library is like a Facebook profit. So that's just splitting the space into different uh, and fitting relation of different slots. So that's what we did in that library. So and then there are other ways you could use. So I'll move to anomaly detection. So anomaly detection is ideal for unbalanced data set. So that's when you have a number of maybe positive data sets and minimal data set. For instance, if you, if you are trying to predict uh, fraud detection, for instance, you know there will be lesser fraud and the most transactional normal, only a few frauds. So that's a typical kind of case for anomaly detection. So now, what I just put, put up here, you see, if you see A, this trend A, trend A is a abrupt transient shift. You're, this is just like maybe <coughs> you, you, you're monitoring some, some popularity of trends on Twitter and something becomes popular quickly. So that would be maybe something to just happen. So you should alert just at the crest, at the tip, at the tip of, um, of the, the, the highest point there, that you should alert as an anomaly. So if you have like a monitoring system, that's when you should send the alerts to the user at that point. Then at B point, immediately that becomes popular and then it becomes normal. You should only alert at the, at the edge of that, of, of the point there, at the edge, when it became a rectangle and that topmost. Top, top right corner of the right angle, that's where you should alert and stop alerting because the trend may have changed over the year. And then if you, if you have this C, if this C part means the distribution does change into another distribution, so you don't have to alert the user. So this is the kind of anomalies I'm tracking. So and they could have business implications for, for how you define the problem. So yeah, then, then the data stream, when you, so everything is a data stream, so there's a time and space complexity, so I want how am I doing for time? 
five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Well, over fast now. So then there's a time and space complexity, uh, detecting concept drifts, and concept drift is, is when the data changes and the distribution changes. So, so any model you're using should be able to handle that. And then sometimes you may want to forget all necessary history or revise your model after significant changes have happened. So, and then how you do those could affect the, the time delay to prediction. So, yeah, there are many ways, like the fixed window is like when you have a sliding window across, moving it. The adaptive window could be you have two windows. So one, one window, you, you, to, you to check, you keep two windows, then you check the difference between both of them. If it if it's, uh, reaches the threshold, you drop the latest one and keep only the recent one. That can help you handle how, how you handle the past layer. The landmark is like, if you notice something important has happened, you could start saving data from that point until something <coughs> significant stop happening. Then the down is the common path that we're using both in our common formulation and other. So it's like, like the common thing, you're forgetting some part of the, of the past. So then there's some primary statistics you have to look it up. So yeah, this, this, this is an algorithm in, the, in an MIT paper that I, I implemented too. So this is just a, a replica of what was described here. So they're just trying to add the forgetting parameters over time. It can be monotonically increasing function, trying to use that to forget the past. And then describing how this, the weighted average you know, currently know is not as good as, as the probabilistic one. When you, you add an extra parameter of the beta, that shows you the, that's the belief you have of the distribution of that data. So, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, this, this is how you do the threshold. So I was planning. Yeah, yeah, so right now I don't have support for multivariate time series. So I was planning if we could um, do an exercise, but we don't have time for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah, so I think it, it's better for me to, to just describe how we do this. So if you, this is just um, um, some, you, you want to have a kind of a, a, a PDF, a probability density function. Uh, you check your data, you maintain the invariance between your priors and your posteriors, and, and keep looking back while checking that your Z score is not, your, your probability is not beyond the threshold. And then this is just all about the exponential moving averages that I've described over the, over the time. And uh, this is just the expectation of a variance. And that's what, that's this, what you want to calculate the kind of a moving variance with a moving standard deviation and a moving Z score just to maintain. Yeah, so if you combine this, you could actually set the threshold. Your threshold will be how you draw this line. So the threshold will be at what part are you keeping? Are you, this is symmetric. But if you add the Z score, you can actually choose which part you, you want to be in. So, and, so then these are just, <laughs> yeah, these are some of the lessons you will learn in the intentions. So it's difficult in the future. And then, thanks for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I guess my brain just imploded. I wouldn't even know how to ask a question right now, but hopefully someone in the audience has a question. Yes, we have. Great. Uh, the Coleman built an update itself yes. uh, based on the recent prediction. Yes. And my question is, what's the difference between reinforcement learning and the common filter? Well, in, in reinforcement learning, you have a, a reward yes. function, but in this case, you don't have that. Yeah, but prediction, you also know yeah. this prediction is, is wrong, then it rewards back when you update yourself. Yeah, and one other difference too is that we don't have uh, a state space method where you have uh, like a state with uh, some measurement, where you, your measurement informs the states. So I think it's, uh, there could be similarities because of the way the long term the convergence based on the Bayesian formulation and other stuff. Yeah, but uh, I think they're different because of at least that was a state space method. And enforcement learning, you, you anticipate future rewards, like exponentially discounted rewards in the future. Okay. Do we have more questions? All right. So uh, I'm curious, you mentioned profit, so I, I don't, I, I'm pretty new in this space about time series. What, what was the advantage of, and what is like Facebook doing with time series data that you're doing that's different? Yeah, uh, Facebook actually, they wanted to use it to predict capacity uh, of, over the like, um, the next week, maybe you're scheduling um, tax load and the capacity, you want to predict 
how will the Lord be next year? That was how they designed the perfect library they have. So, but um, they, they, they didn't have the, the kind of problem I have. Because my problem was like, uh, I wanted to pay like um, a Bitcoin solution on some, because you don't have a lot of um, information that will correlate to that, like a dependent variable on that variable. So you, you, you may want to fit, fit it with some existing indexes. You think may have some relationship with that. And then, so you, you want to be correcting your predictions. As you move on. So that's the difference between uh, my solution and what the thing is, is what I did. So it's a different problem with strength, so. Okay. <laughs> One more question here. So what packages would you recommend for the underlying time series data? I mean, beyond just pandas, data frame, whatever, the time series numbers, and for many of the beyond the pandas? Yeah, I think um, if, you, if you have a problem that's similar to what um, Facebook is solving. The profit library is good. It has a good Python documentation too. So, so that's why this, this, this is a very broad concept. You can do your PhD thesis on stationarity alone. So, so it depends on the kind of problem you're trying to solve. So if your problem requires some properties, like, like the kind of problem I, I was trying to solve, the common formulation was actually better for that kind of a problem. And there were not a lot of libraries that, that, that work with time series, so I had to implement from scratch. And these are the references. Okay, thank you very much, Kenneth. Let's have another round of applause.